Good afternoon, ladies and gents. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 3rd of December. And this month's non-farm payrolls webinar for November. Um, it's certainly, I think, in the context of where we were just before Thanksgiving, um, I think in the in the wake of the Omicron scare, there was a perception perhaps that today's webinar and today's payrolls number, I should say, not today's webinar, today's payrolls number, may have lost some of the importance that perhaps we were thinking about prior to um, the news of Omicron basically dropping around about Thanksgiving and obviously last Friday when we saw those big falls in equity markets. There was a perception perhaps that this new variant might perhaps delay the Federal Reserve in terms of its reaction function when it comes to tapering its asset purchase program. And as a quick recap, I think what we can say is that there was an expectation that having started its tapering program, there's an awful lot of people, me included, who think that the Federal Reserve is behind the curve when it comes to managing inflation and the wider discussion about the T work transitory. So given the uncertainty around the Omicron variant and the fact that we still really are a little bit in the dark about how serious it could be relative to Delta, I think the noise around Omicron obscured the fact that Delta is still a very serious problem, particular, particularly in Europe. And I think there was an awful lot of hysteria around Omicron, um, given the fact that still right now, infections for Omicron are still lagging well behind Delta. And I think the bigger question is not whether or not Omicron is more infectious, but whether it's more deadly. And at the moment, anecdotally, that does not appear to be the case. So does it really affect the wider picture when it comes to the US economy and how well that's doing? Um, but also in terms of the Federal Reserve and whether or not we're likely to see an acceleration um, in the tapering of its asset purchase program when it meets um, in December, the 16th of December. And I think Jerome Powell's hawkish pivot was a little bit of a surprise um, on Tuesday when he said that it was time to retire the word transitory with regard to inflation from the central bank lexicon. And I think the problem is transitory means different things to different people. I mean, at the end of the day, you could argue that we're all transitory in terms of the fact that we're only here for a limited period. So transitory could mean a lifetime. It depends on your, you know, it depends on your definition of what transitory means. When the Federal Reserve was talking transitory in March, there was an expectation that it was probably going to be six to nine months. And yet here we are um, looking at the end of the year and inflation is at a 31 year high in the US um, at 6.2%. We've got US CPI next week um, for November, and that's likely to move up to 6.7% um, with core CPI around 5%. So it's a real problem. And I think the fact that a number of Fed policymakers, even if you ignore Omicron completely, the fact is the Federal Reserve was, was concerned about for inflation even before Omicron hit the airwaves and sort of rather muddied the waters. So in his change earlier this week, today's payrolls number is really important in the overall con conversation when it comes to whether or not the Fed will go from $15 billion of tapering to potentially having a conversation about 30 um, in December, December the 16th. And that's why this today's payrolls number is important to a point, but I think it's going to have to be really disappointing for the Fed to deviate from potentially doubling their tapering to $30 billion a month, which will take it down from 105, which it is now, went from 120 to 105 in November, from 105 to 90 billion. Now, that still means that they're Build, they're growing the balance sheet. They are still being very accommodative. But in terms of pricing, 
in terms of pricing when it comes to rate hikes obviously it means you know what are we pricing for two rate hikes in 2020 or three rate hikes in 2020 and that's the bigger conversation so let's look at the two-year yield because for me that's the most important chart in terms of rate hike expectations for next year because if you compare it to say for example the 10-year that's the 10-year this year we are still at the lowest levels pretty much that we've been since September we're at three month lows on the 10 year the movement in terms of US yields has been in the two year it's been at the front end so it's been two year and five year so the yield curve is flattening the two year is getting closer to the 10 year um, that has consequences it essentially means that the Fed is still looking to go fairly slowly the markets are pricing in a fairly slow pace of rate hikes and that's what's basically moving us up from here now i can remember three months ago we were talking about a break above 0.2 0.3 percent as being bullish for the dollar in terms of the two year and that certainly proved to be the case if you look at the dollar index it's moved quite a bit higher you've got euro dollar below 113. the big question for me is whether today's payrolls report pushes this two year above the peaks that we saw um, back just before Thanksgiving. Obviously, we saw a big drop here um, last Friday as the market started to price out the prospect of a taper and rate hikes next year. Now they're pricing them back in. So, you know, today's payrolls number is going to be quite key in terms of where we go to here. And we've certainly seen that start to get priced back um, in the in the last couple of days. So. Average earnings numbers, if they go up to 5%, average hourly earnings, if they go up to 5%, a decent payrolls number as the unemployment rate drops back, a number in the region of five to 600,000. Again, all very, very positive. The big question is, is whether or not it started to get priced in or priced back in from where it was just before um, that news hit about Omicron. Obviously, that's the big drop on Friday, another drop on Monday, then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and now we're back here. So we're pricing it back in. The big question is, is whether we start to price it even further. And that I'm a little bit concerned about. This week's volatility has really thrown into sharp relief as to whether or not we can expect significant further upside when it comes to equity markets this year more broadly. Me, myself, I think we could well have seen the highs for this year. Now, why do I think that? Well, simply speaking, if we look at the S&P this year, that's year to date. If you're an investor and you're coming into the Christmas period and you've had a really good year, are you going to be looking to take profit or are you going to be looking to build up more exposure? My gut reaction would be, I would look, I would looking to be selling to any strength. And at the moment, we're finding to, we're finding to, we're capped around about 4,600, 4,620. Now, that's not to say that we can't go higher into 2022, um, January, February, and potentially we could drift higher. But I can't help feeling that it's a tough ask to suggest that we could revisit the highs that we saw back at the beginning of Thanksgiving week, simply because there's so much we don't know. There's so much we don't know about Omicron. There's so much we don't know about whether or not countries in Europe will impose further lockdown restrictions on their population. You've only got to look at what's happening in Germany and imposing restrictions on the unvaccinated population and potentially mandating vaccinations going forward for all of those who are unvaccinated. I mean, that's a big step. It's certainly something that I'm very uncomfortable with. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I'm fully vaccinated, um, but, do I favour stigmatising people because they're unvaccinated? It doesn't sit right. I can see the logic behind it. it. Doesn't necessarily mean that I'm comfortable with the idea of it. So looking at this, um, you know, could we see further upside? Potentially, a decent payrolls number. Is that good for risk going forward? Again, that's a tough one because obviously it pushes the dollar higher, it pushes yields higher, um, and could end, and could adversely infect. Uh, affect um, the S&P. FTSE 100, probably less, probably more constructive on it simply because it's cheaper. 
But again, I think we're constrained by the 50-day moving average here. We've got the 7,000 level, which looks fairly solid in terms of the support levels going forward. But on the upside, this 7,200 level is another barrier again. If, if I cast your mind back a few months, we really struggled to get back above 7,200 um, all the way through here, here and here, acted as support back here and here and here. Now we're back below it again, and now we're struggling to get back above it. So again, on the long term, I'm still fairly constructive on the FTSE 100. The big question is, can we get back above 7,400 by the end of this year? And that's a tough, I think that's a tough call at the moment. Again, if I hit the year to date option here, we've, we've, not done, we've not done too badly on the FTSE 100. So the big question is, do you put all of those gains at risks in the hope that we can go higher? I think if we close below 7,000, we could see a correction back lower. But judging by these charts here, there does appear to be fairly decent demand for the FTSE 100 below 7,000. Now the DAX is a slightly different story. That is looking increasingly vulnerable. But again, we got fairly decent support around about 15,000. So again, um, if we do get a dip on the DAX, then we're likely to find you know fairly decent support in and around there, simply because of how the market reacted when we were when we got down there on Wednesday earlier or well, Tuesday earlier this week, we had fairly decent support down there. But is the upside 15,500? We look at that there. We look at that there. It was support there. It was resistance there. So there's a bit of a barrier around about 15,500. In terms of the dollar, particularly euro dollar, if we look at this chart here, we can see that there's decent resistance around about 113.80 all the way through here. So that's a bit of a barrier for me. So even if we get a disappointing number and euro dollar spikes higher, I'd be surprised if we get a significant move back above 113.80. I think we'll probably see another revisit of this 112 area. Dollar strength, I think, is probably the predominant theme heading into the Fed meeting on the basis of the fact that the Bank of England has gone rather soft when it comes to the prospect of a rate hike in December. Michael Saunders this morning talking down the prospects of a hike in December. He was one of the hawks, if you recall, from the last Bank of England meeting, um, but, and it was, was one of those people who was potentially arguing uh, or making the case for a rate hike. He's gone soft on the idea because of Omicron. That's likely to weigh on the pound in the short to medium term. So again, if we look at that, that cable chart here, we really need to see a move back above 134. The price action at the moment is looking a little bit soft. We saw the bottom of this channel here, which I've drawn from the highs in June through the lows in July. We rebounded off it earlier this week. I think there's potential for us to drift back down there around about 130, 160. Why 130, 160? Or here or through here. That's simply on the basis that it was also the low back in December last year. So we're pretty much back at the lows of December last year uh, on the cable. I would be surprised if we broke significantly below that on the basis of the fact that euro sterling, if we look at where the euro is, Christine Lagarde's already said it's unlikely that the ECB will raise rates next year. I think the Bank of England will raise rates next year. I'm not sure the ECB will. So in terms of where we go to, in terms of euro sterling, if we look at the daily chart here, if I draw a line from these peaks through here, any rebounds are likely to find a bit of a barrier around about 85.40 and then 85.70 through here if I draw a line through these highs. And we've also got the 200 day moving average. So euro sterling, I think sell on rallies unless we get a back above this sort of area through here. So what can we expect for payrolls going forward? Um, we're expecting 550,000 for November payrolls. That's for the period up to and including the 14th of November. So any hiring that can, that's come from 14th of November to Thanksgiving won't be reflected in these numbers, will be reflected in the December numbers, which come out the first Friday of January. So if it's a disappointing number or slightly below expectations, not overly concerned about that, been looking at a number of the earnings results from people from, from companies like Walmart and Target, FedEx, 
and, pe and companies like that, and they've said they're having to pay up the staff. That would suggest to me that this average earnings number that is expected to come in around about 4.95% here, if we get a move higher, then that is likely to push the Fed towards an accelerated taper. And we've heard any number of policymakers say that they need to accelerate the taper because it gives them optionality when it comes to a potential rate rise going forward. So watch the average hourly earnings year on year. Um, decent number there. 550 on the headline and obviously the unemployment rate at 4.5, which is expected to come to 4.6. You've also heard me talk about the participation rate, the, the labour participation rate. I want to see, in terms of where we look going forward, whether or not the participation rate goes up, because at the moment it's 2% below where it was in February 2020, where it was 63.7%. There's 5 million Americans who still haven't returned to the workforce. How many of them will actually um, come back? How many of them will have actually retired because of record high stock markets? And how many of them will actually come back? So if we look in terms of the dollar yen, in terms of how the market perceives the robustness of the payrolls report, I'm going to basically display that. If it's a decent report, the dollar should go up. Um, I imagine that the knee-jerk reaction on a decent number will be to um, buy the dollar. The big question is, whether or not it's already priced in to a certain extent in terms of the Fed getting more bullish and whether 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 Powell's testimony earlier this week has done an awful lot of the market pricing already in anticipation of a number. So the numbers are coming out now. Average earnings is 4.8. So that's slightly softer. Um, the payrolls report is disappointing, 210,000. So very much dollar negative, um, which is a little bit disappointing. But the unemployment rate has dropped to 4.2% from 4.6. So, you know, all in all, again, a really mixed bag, really got to struggle to find out what's going on here, because that is a fairly weak number. And I'm struggling to understand how it can be such a weak number, while at the same time, it be su seeing such a big drop in the unemployment rate. So let's have a look. At why the unemployment rate is dropped. I'm just checking the participation rate um, for the um, labour force participation, and that's gone up to 61.8%. So the headline number, yeah, disappointing, but when we look at everything else, it's actually fairly decent. Um, so, and the revision to the previous month, fairly neutral, 546. So take the bones out of that. The headline number is disappointing in terms of the payrolls number. The unemployment number falling back to 4.2% is pretty good. It's very good, in fact. And the participation rate has gone up. So I think while the headline number is disappointing, the rest of it is actually fairly decent. And that's why the dollar is starting to come back. We have dipped down at 113. And now we've bit of had a bit of a rebound as the markets digest the numbers more broadly and now you're getting a little bit of dollar weakness creeping in the euro dollars back above 113.20 and overall equity markets are giving it pretty broadly a pretty pretty big meh when it comes to the actual numbers themselves so for me i think while the headline number is disappointing it doesn't change the calculus when it comes to the fed's discussion um, with respect to um, a taper in December or an accelerated taper. Now, Phil, you've asked me about gold. Um, I really struggle with gold. I've got to be honest with you. It's really uninteresting. You've got a decent area of support all the way through 1760 through here. Today's payrolls number for me does nothing when it comes to changing the outlook for a potentially stronger dollar. Yes, the headline number is disappointing, but everything else about that report looks fairly decent. And actually what we could see in terms of the December number is, which will cover the period up to and including the 14th of December, we could actually see a strong rebound. Let me cast your mind back to when we last had a weak number. Um, I think it was September. September was supposed to be a strong number. We had a weak number. 
came in at 197. It was subsequently revised up to 314. So I think we have to be very, very careful about basically drawing too much of a conclusion from one month's number, because generally what happens is the revision higher in the subsequent, you get a revision higher in a, in a subsequent month. So for gold, decent support through 1760, we can see it through here, low there, low there, low there. Let me just draw that in for you, Phil, and then we can see that. But overall, I think we're probably going to stay in a range between 1760 and um, 18, 1825, 30. I really can't get enthusiastic about gold. It's in a range and it's likely to remain in a range for quite some time to come. I'm actually surprised it's not higher, if I'm honest with you, because you know when, when you're talking in terms of safe havens, um, you would have expected all that stuff about Omicron to have sent it all the way back to the highs um, this year, and that didn't happen, didn't happen at all. Um, and that is a little bit of a surprise to me. And to be quite honest, I'm struggling to find out, I'm tr struggling to understand why. But when you actually look at what gold has done this year, and everything that's been thrown at it, it's lower, and you would you would expect it to be higher. And I think a lot of part of the reason for that is people are putting money in cryptos, they're putting money in Bitcoin, they're putting it in Ether, because they can generate a better return on that. And to be fair, counterintuitively, it's acting as a little bit of a haven. Um, I mean, personally, I wouldn't I wouldn't touch Bitcoin with a barge pole. It's just too volatile. It's too choppy. And it's not something that you'd really want to trade on a leveraged basis, you know, if, if I'm totally honest with you. So for me, I think gold is probably going to trade in a range between 1750 and 1800. And if it does come back down to 1720, you know, it's very much a range play. So I'm sure that's probably not what you wanted to hear. But unfortunately, um, with gold, it's it's, you know, a bit of an enigma and has been for most part of this year. So. In terms of, um, uh, I think Stephen, you asked asked me about dollar mex, didn't you? So let me just jump into that for you uh, to get an idea of where that might go. And um, I look at dollar mex and I think to myself, in terms of timing and looking to buy it again, I'd be reluctant to buy it where it is right now simply because it's just too far away. I mean, yes, it has potential to come back down to around about 2080. And if it does, then these previous highs here are likely to act as some degree of support over the course of the next few days. But up here, you could potentially see an, a lot you know, a lot more weakness in the short to medium term. So in terms of buying dollar mex on dips, I probably wait for it to come back to around about 2090, 2080 perhaps, um, and look at it from that point of view there. But certainly not where it is here. I think there's potential for a little bit more weakness looking at this chart. In terms of copper, being asked about copper, uh, let's have a look at my copper chart. Okay, so this is my copper chart. And as we can see from here, there's fairly decent support all the way through this level here around about 419 but the big the big concern i think i have here is that every time it's rebound to 450 it's come back but we have long-term support coming through here at around about uh four around about 410 and we've also got fairly decent support for 419 so very much a buy on the dips is copper let's face it i think if the supply chain disruptions get sorted and um, we get a significant economic rebound as we head into 2022, then demand for co demand for copper will pick up. At the moment, it's been trading sideways for the past six months since May, when it peaked all the way back here. But it's found fairly solid support pretty much since June, anywhere between 400 and 410. So in terms of the overall longer term outlook, as long as we hold above this, these key areas of support through here, then we should continue to make some fairly decent gains on that. When it comes to Brent, this is my Brent chart. As we can see, it's it's it is quite noisy. But the one thing that I took away from what we saw yesterday 
was that we do have fairly decent support coming in through these lows through here. And the fact that even though we dropped below $68 and we closed all the way up here, suggests there's fairly decent support for Brent crude anywhere down towards this blue line here. Um, and for a move back towards around about $76. I think the sweet spot for crude is between $65 and $75 a barrel. I think in terms of the overall outlook, OPEC plus won't want it below 65, but they won't want it above 75. And I think that was one of the reasons why markets were so surprised that they decided to go ahead with the output increase of 400,000 in January. I think it was because they were very concerned that if they did cut back in January, and then this Omicron scare turned out to be a storm in a teacup, and we got a really strong rebound heading into 2022, that uh, the, a supply shortage could lead to an element of demand destruction, uh, particularly when you've got people talking about $100 oil. Well, $100 oil, what would that do to, to global demand? It would kill it because people are complaining about higher energy prices, higher fuel prices. If that eats into consumers' disposable income, then obviously it could tip the world into recession, um, particularly if prices do go above $86, $87 a barrel. That for me, I think, is a key tipping point on Brent crude. Why did I draw that horizontal line in there? Well, it was because it was the peaks in October 2018. So a technical break above that red line there on a technical basis would trigger us a really sharp move to $100 a barrel. OPEC does not want to see that. Global economy does not want to see that. So we have seen six successive weekly declines in Brent. You know, do we want to continue to see that sort of decline? So if OPEC can keep it in a sweet spot between $65 and $75 a barrel, hopefully everybody's happy. And that for me, I think, is where they want to keep it. And that's that would explain why we saw the extent of the rebound by them inserting optionality into um, the um, decision to leave output exactly where it was. Um, so as I say, we, we will pro for, to my mind, I think we could probably drift drift higher from here and head back towards around about $75, $76 a barrel. And if OPEC can keep Brent crude there, then that will suit them just fine. And I think it's going to be a similar sort of story if, say, for example, we look at WTI. It's a similar sort of story through here. If I take my trend line from this chart here, draw it through those lows in March, draw that through there. Again, it's a similar sort of story. We got a break lower. We weren't able to sustain that break. A very long shadow, which suggests there's some decent demand there. And we could well head back to the 200 day moving average on that. So for me, I think oil remains very much by the dips. OPEC does appear, OPEC plus does appear to have a handle on it. And any dips are likely to be uh, fairly well sought after. So I hopefully that answers your question on that. Natural gas. Again, that's that's bounced off the 200 day moving average. So from a technical point of view, that's probably going to find quite a few bids around there. You've also got the 200 day moving average helping to support prices all the way back in April. Um, so again, here, fairly decent support through there. But you've also got the lows back in August as well, which are likely to act as a fair, fair degree of support through there. And with European natural gas prices, um, continuing to surge higher, I think any downside in natural gas is likely to be constrained by what we saw all the way back there. Okay, so let me just see if I've missed any other questions out. I'm hoping that I've got everything that uh, you guys wanted. Um, we're heading up to 13.42. Um, looking back at dollar yen, gone back to the five minutes and now we're back higher again. We're starting to edge back up. In terms of the overall outlook for dollar yen, I think the bias I think remains for a little bit of resistance at 114. I think we could well drift back down towards around about 112 overall. Um, I think potentially we've seen the high in dollar yen. 
looking looking at this chart here this cloud area should act as a fair degree of support on any dips towards the downside and also the fact that we've got these peaks all the way back through here in September they're likely to act as support as well so if we do see dollar yen start to drift lower over the course of the next few sessions I think it's likely to find a decent area of support around about 112. Um, going back to um, I think I pretty much covered that Euro Swiss um, has made another six-year low so that's likely to keep the pressure on the euro going forward we look at euro swiss here we can see that there we go all the way back i think the euro is likely to remain weak and that's likely to constrain the upside on any euro crosses as well so that's worth bearing in mind when looking at euro dollar which is why i think it will continue to be capped around about 113.80 is there anything that i haven't covered ladies and gents that um you want me to to look at before i sign this off um for 2021 and we talk again in 2022 obviously i still do my weekly videos um i think the last one of those i will probably do will be on the 17th of december that will be the last one until january next year because i will i will be taking time off between the 20th of december all the way back until um the the payrolls webinar the first payrolls webinar on on the first friday in january dollar cad a bit of a non-popular one euro dollar okay let's do dollar cad because we had the canadian payrolls report um earlier today all right let's clean this up a bit because that's no longer relevant we don't need that um looking a bit toppy um dollar cad we can see look at these series of highs all the way through here around about 128.50 i would suggest that um, the bias for dollar cad is likely to be um, a little bit of weakness um, while below 128.50 um, and i and it also ties in with my slightly more bullish um, view on oil prices because ultimately if oil prices go back to 75 dollars a barrel um then the cash should benefit from that and the us dollar should weaken so we could well drift back down to the mid 127s uh, and this area through here um such a petro currency um, um and the strength in the oil price the weakness in the oil price over the course of the past six weeks has hurt the canada and the dollar is appreciated as a consequence of that so if you think the oil price is going to strengthen then dollar cad is likely to drift lower um euro aussie we've got the rba next week that's an that's going to be a diff that's going to be an interesting one um so let's talk about that um obviously we've seen quite a bit of uh, weakness in the australian dollar over the course of the past few weeks um i think this one is probably going to be more of an aussie story thomas uh let's look at the aussie I was looking at this earlier today we've seen an awful lot of weakness in the aussie over the course of the past few weeks but for me what's significant is this series of lows that we saw in september 2020 and october 2020. now as i said we've got the rba next week and governor low did last month he talked about potential rate rise not happening much before 2023 now i would dispute that um the rbnz hiked rates last month by 25 basis points to 0.75 percent the rba is sitting at 0.1 is that sustainable no it's not now they abolished yield curve control they got rid of yield curve control um, at the last meeting and he was very dovish but i do not see that Lowe's assertion that Australia doesn't have an inflation problem isn't in any way credible. It's not. The whole world has an inflation problem. Now, the Australian economy was actually slightly more resilient over the third, the last quarter, because we were expecting a, a contraction of 2.7%. The economy actually contracted by 1.9%. So that was much better than expected. So the Australian economy is in much better shape 
than perhaps an awful lot of people give it credit for. That for me should constrain the downside in Aussie dollar to around about 69.90, 69.80, which would suggest to me that perhaps we could get a hawkish surprise next week. Next week, the RBA could spring a hawkish surprise. I think the market is short Aussie dollars and that we could, the RBA could surprise and the surprise could outweigh any expectation that the Fed is likely to be hawkish. Fed hawkishness is priced into the Aussie already, I would suspect. Now, I could be wrong here, um, you know, and let's face it, you know, looking at the price action, I don't think I'd want to be short Aussie dollar down here if I was currently short already. I'd be looking to take a little bit of my short positions out and start to pair that back a little bit. For me, the downside in the Aussie, based on the fact that we've got this support level around about 70, we're probably gearing up for a little bit of a short squeeze heading into the Christmas period. That's just my that's just my humble opinion. So take it take that what yeah it is in a downtrend absolutely the trend is lower but look at this i mean look at you know if we if we change that to a weekly chart you know, and spring it all out there this level here is huge 69 90 70. if we break through that you know australian dollar has declined one two three four five weeks in a row so you know on a risk reward basis if you were short aussie now what would you do and that's basically all you know that's all i'm going to say on the matter on a risk reward basis if you were short aussie now what would you do i'd lower my stop because the risk reward now for being short is starting to it's not it's not as compelling it's not as compelling so the RBA, I think, could be could be a significant. It'll be an interesting. It'll be an interesting dynamic as to how low Governor Low steers market expectations about future RBA interest rate expectations going forward, because he can't be overly bearish on the Australian economy given the recent data that we've already seen. So how does he walk that tightrope? Anyway, okay. So that's 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 the Aussie dollar. Any, anyone else, ladies and gents? All right. Well, thanks very much for your company this year on these non-farm payrolls webinars. It's been most enjoyable. I appreciate all of your feedback. It's really useful. Um, if you do have any comments to make on anything that you've heard today or what have you, um, I'd appreciate all the, any feedback, good or bad. But if I don't speak to you before Christmas or just speak, speak, speak to you before next year, I'd just like to wish all of you um, a very Christmassy, very good Christmas um, and a very pleasant new year. Um, thanks very much for your company. And I'll speak to you all same time, same place next month. And um, thanks for your company. It's, um, it's been great. Cheers. Speak to you all soon.